Hey everybody, how's it going? I'm James Mahoney of Black Lobster Academy. This multi-part tutorial is designed to be the ultimate beginner's guide to Photoshop for anyone interested in using Photoshop to create illustrations, artwork, or designs. It's a fairly comprehensive course that covers all the basics you need to be familiar with before you could take my online digital illustration course. I've put a lot of effort into figuring out what to leave out of this tutorial trying to pare down the tutorial to just the bare essentials to get you on your way. So to get started, you will need a pressure-sensitive pen or tablet. You can find reviews of these Wacom tablets on my blog. Of course, you'll also need a copy of Adobe Photoshop, preferably CS6. Older versions are okay too. If you're a student somewhere, you can get a big discount. I have links for these on my blog too. And the last thing before we get started, I suggest you download the keyboard shortcuts PDF from the blog, the productivity set, which has all the main keyboard shortcuts you're going to need to know to get started. Okay, let's go. So this is the Photoshop interface for CS6. In Photoshop, you create and manipulate images using a wide assortment of tools. And these tools are arranged around your work area in panels, menus, and bars. But don't be intimidated by the massive number of tools. After an hour or so of these tutorials, you'll start feeling very comfortable. In the center, you have your work area or canvas. The documents you are working on are arranged in tabs along the top. Down in the lower left-hand corner is a percentage, which shows you how much it's zoomed in or zoomed out. Along the left, you have your tools panel. If I hover over a tool, a tooltip will come up with the name of the tool and the shortcut key. If it has the little arrow on the bottom corner and you press and hold, a sub-menu will come up which will show you a group of tools. If you select your tool, along the top you'll get a control panel that will give you access to change how that tool behaves. For instance, on the brush, if I click on this, I can switch which brush I want. I can change many things about it, etc. So this is, I think of this as like the properties, the most useful properties for each of the tools that you have. But then for the deeper things, you'll, tip, you'll typically want to use the uh, panels. Over here you have your panels. Some of them are, are active along the top here as well. For instance, I can open up these brush panels from here. These little buttons over here, the, the little chevron, if I click that, it collapses. Opens up and collapses. There's also this little down arrow with these, uh, looks like text, bars. If you click on that, it'll open up with a menu that's specific to this panel. These panels I've left open. For instance, the layers panel, one of the most useful ones but it behaves just the same as the other ones. I can collapse it or expand it. It also has this little button up here which opens up things that are related to the layers panel. I just made it disappear, didn't I? If you're not seeing the panel that you need, look in the window menu. For instance, layers. For many of the panels, there's a set of buttons down at the bottom that are useful for that particular panel. Your arrangement of windows, panels, buttons, menu bars, all of that is called your workspace. And up here you can save your workspace, you can switch between different workspaces, and you can, like I said before, you can find whatever panel or whatever is missing. So let's start with the basics. In Photoshop, you're going to be making images. The images are bitmaps made of tiny picture elements or pixels. Each of these squares is a pixel. A pixel is just one solid color. The color is made up of having components of red, green, and blue. So these pixels have a full value of red and nothing else. And these ones full value of green and nothing else. And these ones blue and nothing else. 
you can see that by going to the channels which shows you the different values for this image in of just the red just the green and just the blue to create a new file or new document you can choose file new or you can hit the command n this brings up a dialog, allows you to name it. You can set the size, height, resolution, etc. Hit OK, and you have a new document. To open an existing file, hit File, Open, and you can choose a file. One cool trick that you can do is you can open an existing file as a different format. For instance, I can open this and I can open it even though it is actually a JPEG. I can switch this to Camera Raw. When I open it in Camera Raw, it brings up a new dialog that opens up all kinds of possibilities. I can fix the exposure, contrast, etc. This is a great tool if you're using photographs and you want to clean them up and fix them up. One of the tools that's really great is this one up here. It's a targeted adjustment tool. Click on that. You can come in here and you can say, um, you click on a pixel and then you can make it more or less in that region. Lights, darks, etc. And then you hit open image and it will open. To navigate around the image, you can use the navigator and zoom in or out. You can also grab the area in here and just pan it around. Or what most people use is you press the space bar and you can just drag inside here. You can also press the spacebar and the command key together and zoom out by moving left and zoom in by moving to the right. Very useful short keyboard shortcuts are to use the command zero, which will fit the image onto your screen, and command one, which will zoom into actual pixels. You can tell it's actual pixels because you'll see the 100% down here. You can easily crop an image in Photoshop by hitting the letter C for crop or selecting the crop tool from your tool panel. You can at that point either drag these corners in or any of the edges in or perhaps uh, more simply is to just drag and select the area that you want and then make adjustments from there. You can also rotate while you're cropping. Hit enter or return to freeze the selection. The thing that's unique to CS6 is this new switch which is delete cropped pixels. Whereas if you leave that unchecked, it retains the pixels that are outside the cropped area so that if you've changed your mind, you can still move it around a little and make some changes. It just records that this is the part of the picture that you're interested in, but retains the information around it. You can change the actual size of the image by hitting Command Option I, and that will give you the dimensions of the image, the width and the height. I tend to keep these in pixels. You can change them to percent. I use pixels. I, I, for right now, I recommend that you just ignore the document size, inches, and all that. Pixels is really what you're dealing with. It's much simpler if you just think about it as pixels and work from there. You constrain proportions means that if I change this, let's say I change that to 500, it will keep the proportions the same. Leave this as bicubic automatic and you're all set. If I wanted to distort the image, um, I could 
uncheck constraint proportions and I could change this to say 700 and now you see that this value st just stays where it was and it's distorted. So whereas that command option I change the, the pixel dimensions of the picture what if I wanted to just say add some uh, some pixels onto one of the edges but I wanted to leave this the same then what I'm doing is I'm changing the canvas size and that's similar it's option command but instead of I it's C and it allows me to add or subtract pixels from there this dot here determines where is the picture that's currently there whereabouts does it go so if let's I put it up in the upper corner and then I add some dimensions on both of these say 600 by 800 it now adds that and it uses the background color which is right here to fill that sometimes it's useful to have a grid so you can align things uh, or measure things and to do that you can turn it on with the command and the apostrophe apostrophe key is the one that's right next to the return key and that will turn on a grid that allows you to accurately align and see what you're doing you can set the grid spacing by coming up to Photoshop preferences guides grids and slices and you can set it here if I set that to 100 maybe subdivisions of 20 it changes where the, the grid lines go I personally don't use the grid all that often but I use guides all the time let me show you how I use those to use the guides you first need to turn on the rulers and that is command R I think the menu is uh, up here rulers right there command R and then you can just drag out you click inside the rulers and you drag out to some position and these are not in your image they're just part of Photoshop that will help you to align things also all the tools will snap to it um, so you could like lay uh, shapes on these forms very easily the other thing you can do is for these rulers is you can grab this corner up here and you can drag that this is where zero is you can grab it to anywhere you want so now if you look at the rulers at this point it's zero and it goes up from here and down from there and same with here so the zero point has been changed to right there this is really useful if you're trying to uh, be accurate in terms of a layout and you're trying to measure things and whatnot you can then toggle the the guides on and off with the command semicolon turns them on off on and if you want to clear them you go to view clear guides you can save your file by coming up to file and choose save as if it's the first time or you want to change a new name or save if you've already had it you can also use the hotkeys command s or shift command s this file has not been saved when you uh, go to save a file you have several choices in terms of what the formats are if you want to retain the layers and all the structure of your file you have to save it as a Photoshop file typical file formats are usually I recommend just use JPEG if it's a photograph if it's an image and if you want to have it compressed JPEG will be sometimes a little bit lossy you will lose some of the quality perhaps if you need it to be perfectly crisp um, without any loss you might use a PNG file or a ping file this file format is is not lossy but sometimes can be a little bit larger let me just show you the, uh, the dialog for the JPEG. If I save it as a JPEG, I'll get a dialog which will allow me to compress it. So remember that there's going to be some loss or degradation. I've found that if anything above 8, usually you can't see it, never go below 6. So between 6, six to 8, 6 to 9, if it's, uh, you can see what, how big it is right here and depends on how important it is for it to be a small file but somewhere in around 8, 9, 10, somewhere in there is usually a good spot. And that's pretty much it. Now that we have some of the real basics out of the way, in the next 
video, the next section, we cover brushes and painting. It starts getting real fun. Check it out. Thanks a lot. Yeah.